We are here live in Chicago, Illinois. As you can see behind me, we are at the protest. We're here, the March for Palestinian Resistance. Hi, who are you with? Uh, my name is uh, Eamon, I'm a reporter. And who are you with? I'm a reporter. Uh, where are you with? I'm Jack Sue, with Real American News. I knew it. I was just being suspicious. I was like, you look familiar. Yeah, no, we're live. You get a shake. It's a tell us who you're with. No, I'm okay. Thank you. I'm a reporter. I'm not supposed to be doing interviews. Okay. I was just trying to confirm where you were. Well, you, and if you could confirm where you worked then, because I just did. No, thanks. Why not? How many abortions have you had? How many abortions have you had? How many abortions have you had today? DNC. I'm getting paid by George Soros to have an abortion on the stage with no drugs. Which way are you going? Which way are you going? What do you mean, which way? Which type of abortion? What kind of abortions are there, Jack? There's there's pills, there's tools, there's a number of ways. So it's going to be on stage. So a normal person would think that they would use tools, right? And vacuum it out and do all of that. Like if I took a pill that takes several days and nothing happens, you won't see anything. So you should probably like study how female anatomy works. Oh, because you're with the guys with the vasectomies. You're on the vasectomy side of it. I'm not fucking anybody currently. So like I don't understand. Do you understand? They, they will. They will cut this if there's with this language. I, I do. You're a fuck, Jack. All right. To you. Well, I, we, one of the you things that we have. I, I, I can, but we can't. We can't have the language. Can't have the language. I, 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 I was standing. You just watched some clips from videos that far-right provocateur Jack Posobiec posted himself. Believe it or not. And it's hard to believe that you would want other people to see that since it was so humiliating for you. But nonetheless, he decided to do it. Now, as you saw, the goal was to infiltrate the pro-Palestine protest taking place at the DNC by disguising himself as one of the protesters. He wore a keffiyeh, but he was discovered almost immediately. And I say that because that person that you saw him try to interview, that was the first interview he tried to conduct, but they knew exactly who he was. Jack Posobiec. Everyone knows him. Now, the women who he interviewed were clowning on him, and he seemingly didn't even realize it. But I also love how he's supposed to be this edgy, far-right provocateur, yet he's scolding the people he's trying to make fun of because they're the ones using naughty words. It's honestly just so embarrassing, but his goal here was to make people standing in solidarity with Palestine look crazy and unhinged, but he ended up looking like the imbecile instead. Now, when it comes to the pro-Palestine protests at the DNC convention in Chicago, which was expected, by the way, you're probably going to see claims that they're supporting Hamas or they're anti-Semitic, or you'll see some videos shared on social media of somebody saying or doing something stupid in order to make the rest of the protesters seem unreasonable, like Jack Posobiec tried to do. But understand that these are bad faith actors making a bad faith argument. And it's not just Jack Posobiec. Laura Loomer, for example, falsely claimed that Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro wasn't able to even attend the DNC since organizers couldn't guarantee his safety since he's Jewish. But as somebody quickly pointed out, he was there speaking to CNN while at the convention and safe. And on top of that, Jewish people like Bernie Sanders and Doug Harris, Kamala Harris's husband, have prime speaking spots. So, as you can see, there's an active effort to slander pro-Palestine protesters, but it's important to put aside the narratives that they try to spread and always recenter the conversation on why those people are protesting in the first place. But you shouldn't hear it from me. You should hear it from the people there. Palestinian Americans, this is a fundamental issue. Um, and we have, we have spent 10 months watching our people die every day simply come out and just wait and hope that some change will happen before the election. It's, it, it's just offensive and it's, it's completely insensitive to where we are as a community. That was sociology professor Iman Abdelhadi telling Democracy Now! why they've showed up to protest. Because people are still dying and Biden hasn't implemented the policy change that would actually bring about a ceasefire. He hasn't used his leverage and as a result, people are still dying. That's why they're there. They want change. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the pro-Palestine movement against genocide is not a monolith. You have some individuals protesting there that are part of the abandoned Biden movement who are actively encouraging people to vote third party. And then you have others who are willing to vote for Harris if she commits to an arms embargo. And then finally, you have other people who are actively working within the Democratic Party to drive change within. But regardless of whatever strategy they're pursuing there, what they want, the underlying goal 
is the same. They want to end U.S. complicity with genocide in Gaza. Now, prior to the protests at the DNC, you had not another bomb coalition march through Brooklyn to call for an arms embargo on Israel. And on Monday, to kick off the DNC convention, you had thousands of protesters show up in solidarity with Gazans, and their message was very, very clear. As the Chicago chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace explained via Twitter, they're marching on the DNC to demand an immediate arms embargo. And listen, it's important to keep in mind that this protest would not be happening right now if Biden did what he needed to do months ago and implemented an arms embargo. It's not an unreasonable ask. I mean, Republican presidents have done the same thing. Reagan did this when an Israeli prime minister was bombing Lebanon, right? There's a reason why these ceasefire talks have been going on for months and why Biden has not been able to get an actual ceasefire. It's because he has not used his leverage. So Israel has no reason to stop the bombing if they know that the bombs are going to continue to come regardless of what they do or don't do. So don't be mad at the protesters if you hate to see all these protests at the DNC. Be mad at Biden for refusing to do the bare minimum after 10 months of genocide. And I don't necessarily think that Kamala Harris would be amazing on this issue, nor do I expect her to defy Biden while she's the vice president. But some members of the uncommitted movement are hopeful that she would be better on this issue, and I think for good reason. So I want to play a clip from the uh, uncommitted campaign where CNN's Donio Sullivan is going to talk to them, and they're going to give us their take. This interview was conducted on Sunday. Here's what they said about Harris. We've got 30 uncommitted delegates that are representing over 740,000 uncommitted voters nationwide who voted uncommitted as a pro-peace, anti-war vote in the Democratic primary. This is a meeting of uncommitted Democratic delegates here in Chicago on the eve of the Democratic National Convention. But it's not sustainable for our own government to fund the mass killing of civilians. Folks become delegates at their state party and then they come to the national convention and they're either committed to the candidate, to one of the candidates or not. In our case, we're not committed because we haven't heard what we've wanted to hear. Looking for a ceasefire, we're looking for a strong commitment on a ceasefire. We're looking for an arms embargo uh, for us to stop sending weapons that are contributing to the genocide there. I represent uh, some of the over 101,000 voters in Michigan who voted uncommitted as a pro-peace, anti-war vote. Nobody wants to see Trump in November. We are a very anti-fascist movement. We are actually doing what we can to save the Democratic Party by saying, listen, VP Harris, there is a key base of over 730,000 anti-war voters who are telling you that we want to see you turn the page on Gaza policy and save Palestinian lives. What do you want to hear from Harris in Chicago this week? I want to hear from Vice President Harris how it is that she's going to turn a new page on Gaza policy from the destructive and disastrous policy of the last 10 months to one that saves lives. You got to meet Harris briefly yes. in Michigan. I told her that we need a policy shift that will save lives in Gaza. My, my community is telling me that they're losing tens and hundreds of their family members. And she said it's horrific. She's been incredibly empathetic. I do have to say that. more. We have seen more empathy and compassion from Vice President Harris, but that is not enough. Palestinian children can't eat words. Is there more hope in this movement right now with Harris at the top of the ticket than there was when Biden was there? I think that in general, we would all say we're cautiously optimistic. There is a little bit more wiggle room, we feel like, with Vice President Harris. We've already seen her change the rhetoric a little bit, but words are not enough. And I think that their cautious optimism makes sense. As I said, I'm cautiously skeptimistic because I don't necessarily expect a drastic policy shift from Harris or any Democrat for that matter. But I think that her rhetoric and willingness to meet with the uncommitted organizers is a really good sign. She's gone further than Biden has gone in just expressing empathy. But of course, more needs to be said, more needs to be done. But we haven't really seen any firm commitments from Harris on this issue yet, aside from the meeting, which is good. But Harris is in a tricky situation because if she did come out ahead of Biden and say, I support an arms embargo or I would support an arms embargo as president, Netanyahu could try to further entrench the U.S. by starting a war with Iran that would pull in a Harris administration as well and lock her in. This is a uh, you know something that I hadn't really thought about until I heard Sam Cedar talk about this on the Majority Report, and it makes sense. Netanyahu knows what he's doing. He's a very savvy politician, as evil as he is, and if Harris did signal that she would break from Biden in a strong way, he could try to do something 
to fuck her over before she even gets into the, into the White House. And it's one of many reasons why a lot of people don't necessarily expect a strong departure from Harris, at least while she's on the campaign trail. But having said that, though, she does still need to find ways to signal a policy change to voters, even if she's not going to say that explicitly. I think that a meeting with the uncommitted organizers would go a long way. Now, one of those organizers actually shared some positive news that demonstrates how persuasive and influential the uncommitted movement has become. And what she says here is genuinely encouraging. Hi, everyone. My name is Layla Labid, and I'm here in Chicago at the Uncommitted National Movement headquarters preparing for the Democratic National National Convention and I have historical news for you. What makes this historic is for the first time in our country's history and the history of the Democratic National Convention is that we will have a panel discussing Palestinian human rights as an official part of the DNC program. This panel is going to be featuring Palestinian voices, including my own, as well as Palestinian Hala Hajazi. This panel is also going to include the voice of Dr. Tanya Haj Hassan, who is a renowned pediatric intensive care physician that has been serving the men, women, and children in Gaza who have been experiencing the very real human impact of our U.S. policy decisions. We thank the DNC for working with us on creating this historical panel while we continue focusing on policy change. And that right there is why it's so important to keep up the pressure on the Democratic Party. That's why these protests are necessary. The Democratic Party can't pretend like these folks don't exist. They are forced to take Palestinian human rights at least a little bit more seriously, even if this isn't much. It's just symbolic, right? And the party has a very long way to go, needless to say. But that right there is a sign that these organizers who have been working for months are starting to break through just a little bit, which is significant because for the longest time, neither party represented people who care about Palestinian human rights. And it's a constituency that's just been ignored right? But now they've made it so they can no longer be ignored. The Democratic Party can no longer afford to take them for granted. And this was what one of the co-founders of the Uncommitted Movement explained in an interview on CNN. And the goal of what they're going to do at the convention is try to send a strong message to Kamala to get her to be more direct in how she's going to differ from Biden. Backstage at that Detroit rally, I had the chance to shake Vice President Harris's hand and tell her what I know to be true, that uncommitted voters and uncommitted delegates like me want to support Vice President Harris, but need her to support a policy that stops sending weapons to the Israeli military that is using them, that is using those weapons to kill people we love, to kill civilians. And I asked her if we could meet with her to discuss that, and she indicated an openness to that. And I do find hope in the fact that Vice President Harris is engaging on this critical issue. But what's very important here is we, in, in the context of over 40,000 killed using U.S. bombs in the context of the escalating bombings that are happening of, 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 of Palestinian civilians in Gaza, of my own family members in South Lebanon. My aunt called me, told me she's sleeping right now with her slippers under her pillow. So that way, in case the bomb drops, she, she has something on her feet when she has to run. These are real human beings that we love, that we're connected to. And so I, my advice to Vice President Harris is if you want to address the, the, the essential demands, the essential cries of protesters, of activists, of, of regular everyday people all around our country who want to see a better approach. It's not a matter of a change of tone. Tell us, tell me, Vice President Harris, tell our movement, how do you plan to stop sending weapons to kill civilians who happen to be, many of them, people who are our family members, who are our siblings, people we love? I think it's a reasonable ask for us to want to hear about that ahead of this November's election. It's the most reasonable demand imaginable. And again, I don't expect an explicit or significant departure from Harris while she's on the campaign trail, since she still is vice president, who is going to toe the line for the administration she's part of. But there are other ways to communicate things or signal a policy shift without saying it directly, which is why I think a meeting with the uncommitted organizers that she agreed to is really important, because people who want to stop the genocide trust them. Right. So if she gives them private assurances and they then tell the people that they're representing that they can feel confident that Harris would be different than Biden and that she'd be maybe open to an arms embargo, I think that that would go a really long way. But one thing I want to stress again is that Kamala Harris wouldn't be in this predicament right now if Biden hadn't handled this so terribly. In fact, Biden started to go down in the polls after this happened. Now, 
Correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation, but needless to say, a lot of people are dissatisfied with the way that Biden handled this situation because he's basically as bad as you could possibly get on this issue. And as Mehdi Hassan put it in an op-ed for The Guardian, Biden's Gaza policy is a liability for Kamala Harris. She must break with Biden now. And in this article, he goes on to talk about the parallels between this election and the 1968 election where Lyndon B. Johnson announced that he was not seeking re-election after he lost public support over the Vietnam War. Now, his vice president back then, Hubert Humphrey, took over and was really reluctant to depart from Johnson on Vietnam and publicly supported it even though he privately opposed it because he was the vice president and it's just kind of what vice presidents are expected to do and to make matters worse johnson also was pressuring him to not defy him on vietnam but after a while he couldn't not public sentiment was so overwhelming that humphrey finally did what he needed to do and he came out against the vietnam war explicitly but he lost and that's been the takeaway for democrats for decades Humphrey defied the president and lost. But Mehdi Hassan has an entirely different takeaway than the popular takeaway. Mehdi's takeaway isn't that it's bad politics to support good policy. The takeaway is that Humphrey's change came a little bit too late. And he writes, Humphrey spent much of 1968 defending both Johnson and the war. He was less a candidate for change and more like a son who feared a punitive father, to quote Offner. Harris is not Humphrey. Gaza is not Vietnam. 2024 is not 1968. Nevertheless, the similarities that do exist are too glaring to ignore. The current vice president would do well to recall the words of then vice president after his narrow defeat in 1968. Quote, I ought to not have let a man who was going to be a former president dictate my future. And what Mehdi Hassan is arguing is that Harris should apply what Humphrey learned and not take away what everybody else took away from that. That, oh, you defy the president, so you lost. No, he waited too long to defy the president. And that's one of the reasons why he lost and Nixon won. Now, one key difference between Harris and Humphrey is that Harris has way more support from the Democratic Party's base going into the convention than Humphrey did. So Gaza isn't hurting Harris as much as Vietnam hurt Humphrey. But with that being said, it's still hurting her. That's undeniable. And I'll say it again. I don't expect her to openly defy Biden on this issue after Democrats have been, have been programmed for decades to think that a vice president can never, ever defy a president. But as I said earlier, there's a way to say and do things without directly saying and doing them, especially to people who matter the most, like those uncommitted organizers who are more than willing to work with her that she plan to meet with. So that's going to be a really important meeting. Either way, this issue is very important, and obviously it's not going away anytime soon. So this protest was expected. And the people who are protesting are putting pressure on the Democratic Party because they want the genocide to stop, and they're doing the right thing, just as the people protesting the DNC in 1968 were doing the right thing. And if you want Harris to win like I do, don't bemoan the protesters because this pressure is making her a better candidate. And I say this because after she initially reacted to protesters who disrupted her rally in Michigan with a terrible response, a couple of days later, guess what happened? She improved. She had a much better response that was much more empathetic, and she called for a ceasefire. Now, that tells me that she's much more open to listen to criticism and adapting than Biden, right? So the criticism is making her a better candidate. The pressure is making her a better candidate. So... More needs to be said, more needs to be done, but that's what the protesters are trying to do. They're trying to get her to be the candidate that they need her to be on this particular issue. But as they fight to stop a genocide, there's going to be bad faith actors like Jack Posobiec, like Laura Loomer, and of course, Democrats like Richie Torres, who are trying to attack and smear these protesters who are doing the right thing. But at the end of the day, the protesters are the ones that will be remembered as being on the right side of history while the people smearing them won't even be a footnote in future history books. So stay focused and always recenter these conversations back to what matters, stopping a genocide.